Okay, personal story time. You can't tell this on camera, but I'm a very, very tall person. And yeah, it has a lot of advantages, but much like Joe Walsh, I can't complain, but sometimes I still do. And there's one or two drawbacks. The biggest one is that I have developed an extremely poor posture over the years. Despite many warnings that I should stand up straight, stretch, develop core strength, now, nearly 40 and having ignored all of those warnings, I am seeing a physical therapist because my back and my knees are fucked. Little decisions add up to large pain, but it's not too late to fix things. And that brings us to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which slipped a disc and fell over last weekend for the whole world to see when the Marvels absolutely flopped. I've fallen and I can't get up. Pile on top of that was news that other projects aren't screening well and had to be postponed and rewritten and reshot. Yes, Disney's chickens are coming home to roost, and there was ample warning that they refused to listen to. The good news is, it can be fixed with a whole lot of work. But in order to fix something, you have to admit it's broken to begin with, which they may or may not do. Let's look at some developments. But real quick, I want to talk to you about my desk. YouTube can be really cool because people will offer to send you stuff. But then you have to review it on camera, and it might be something you don't even use, and that can feel a little icky. One such company, Flexispot, offered to send me a standing desk, and I retorted, I already own more than one of your desks that I paid for with my own money. Having just read The Art of the Deal, I convinced them to sponsor the video, and they went for it. Easiest job ever. Before I ever made a single video, I really was in the market for a standing desk for my wife. She wanted one for a makeup station so she'd get ready without getting up and down. I did a bunch of comparisons and I wound up on this, the Flexispot model EW8. You got a bunch of preset height adjustments, handy USB chargers right in the front, including a super fast USB-C. You got a big work area, drawer, this is my drawer of shame. I got her one, I was immediately jealous. So I got myself one, which I use in the more traditional fashion. A lot of people are working from home these days and you might wanna upgrade from working at your kitchen counter. This desk is a great solution, but a standing desk is more than just for an office. Most recently, we got a third one that my daughter uses for school. This week, Flexispot has a lot of great Black Friday deals going on. There are links below. You should definitely check it out. To start with, you probably know by now that the Marvels had the lowest opening weekend of any MCU film, bringing in just $47 million domestically and just a fraction more internationally. Second place after them was 2008's Hulk with $55 million, 15 years ago. Heading into its second weekend, it had a worldwide gross of about $115 million. But, hey, maybe the audience was just spooked, and the good word of mouth was gonna give it legs! <laughs> no, 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 the second weekend drop was 78%. This movie had the worst opening weekend and the worst second weekend in MCU history by wide margins. And this movie cost at least $270 million plus marketing! Most estimates put it at needing at least $800 million just to break even. In a previous video, I thought I was making like an insanely low prediction when I said it would be in the 400s. Now, based on the current trajectory, we're seeing projections that it might actually land in the 300s, maybe even the high 200s. That is absolutely insane. All right, so it failed, both critically and commercially. That, that's just a plain fact. But now the autopsy begins, because we, and especially Marvel, need to know why exactly it failed, and if it can be fixed. Uh, Carol, what do you think? Can it be fixed? Now it's too late. Don't be pessimistic. Let's look at it. Right on cue, there are the slew of accusations that the misogynist and racist fans are review bombing and boycotting a film led by three women. The Marvel fan base is just a rabid den of wolves who howl in rage and terror at the very thought of the MC uterus. First of all, that claim is false. I'm working on a video covering a few decades of strong and simultaneously well-written female characters that have done well commercially. So no, the fan base doesn't reject women out of hand, but let's put on the clown wig of a typical journalist for a second and pretend that this actually is true. Let's live in the fantasy world where the MCU audience is 99% men and they all hate female heroes. If that were the case, and the studio continued to put up heroin after heroin, at what point are they to blame for making a product that this fictitious audience hates so much? 
It's such a weird mindset to believe that the audience is full of istophobes, but never questioning why a movie studio would continue to make a product the istophobes hate so much. But back here, in reality, the real answer is that Disney especially has leaned so far into identity politics that they forgot character traits are more than skin or genital deep. These characters have no character. If you've seen the Marvels, you'll know that generic female villain has no arc. Kamala has no arc, but a little personality. Carol has no arc, but is, you know, slightly less wooden than her first movie. And Monica has no arc and no personality. She can barely be called a character. You could replace her lines with like an old timey silent film title card because she is just there to info dump. None of these women had anything in the script to inform their decisions or move the plot. But obviously the heads of the MCU thought all four did have an amazing character trait. They have vaginas. And somehow their mere possession of labia would draw in other vaginal owners like some kind of yonic tractor beam. You know, they must have been extremely survexed when very few women showed up to see it. According to various sources, somewhere between 25 and 40% of viewers were female. Other reports show that less than 20% of viewers were in Gen Z. The movie's female leads in bubblegum pop tone were obviously directed toward younger and female viewers, yet failed on both accounts. So no, it wasn't toxic men that sank your movie, it was your bad movie that sank your movie. And they tried everything. They had a subplot about cute kittens. They had a goofy side thing about a planet where everybody sings. Right when they get there, somebody's singing and everybody's doing this like weird hand motion, okay? This is the level of dancing like with chilies. You know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> no, 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 I, I didn't mean, I didn't, no! No, I did not mean it. No, I will not go back. No, no! Now I mean you. What? What happened? Oh my god, my shoulders! Oh! Something I think is very interesting is that the movie lacked a lot of performative diversity, or what some call woke. I predicted that director Nia DaCosta and co-star Tiana Paris would try to inject some kind of blunt political messaging in this, and I was completely wrong. This is important to point out because in the past we can point directly to DEI stuff and show how it affects the writing. She-Hulk's whole speech about how she knows what oppression is like but Bruce Banner doesn't was hilarious and was a direct result of Jennifer Gao's feminist power fantasy that she wanted to tell. Black in America and Ironheart, which we'll talk about in a moment, were reduced to diversity token characters and the writing suffered for it. Even the original Captain Marvel was poorly written because the writers wanted to emphasize how strong and tough Carol Danvers was, but they forgot to include any relatable weaknesses, which are what make a character interesting. Honestly, I just think they're out of ideas at this point. I, I, Jay, you think they got any cards left? They should know they hand in because they ain't got no space. Agreed, completely out of tricks. But aside from a few small side examples, the Marvels didn't do the whole the message thing, and yet it still flopped. And this is important to look at for a couple of reasons. First, I think it shows how badly the Disney brand has been damaged by their reliance on performative diversity. People are unwilling to give them a chance if they think it's just gonna be another preachy mess. We didn't have any way of knowing if this movie was going to be a sermon or not, and it's obvious that the audience no longer trusts the MCU to deliver a fun, engaging experience. So opening weekend sales were low while everyone waited to see what the reviews brought. The other reason that it's important to point out the very few woke moments is that it removes the excuse for why the writing is bad. It's one thing to say that politically motivated writing turns out bad, but this? This is just junior level stuff, and there is no excuse beyond laziness or sheer hubris on the part of the MCU thinking the audience would just lap up whatever was thrown out onto the porch. As I said earlier, these characters don't move the story. The story just moves, and they respond. Their responses, their actions, their dialogue, nothing tells us anything about these women. There is no depth. The villain is hilarious because the number one complaint about the MCU for 15 years is that their villains are terrible and it's like they took it as a challenge to make the worst one yet. There is no cohesiveness to this story. The bad guy motivation is half-hearted, especially when at the end, Captain Marvel just reignites their son without any problem. The tone of the movie is all over the place. Nick Fury is the least Nick Fury you've ever seen. 
In short, it's just a bad movie. Now, while we're talking about performative diversity, there are a couple of parts I want to point out just to show you how light they were going here. Some people have pointed out that the only white guy was the villain's henchman, the man bun fella. I think it's a stretch to call something woke just because there are no white guys, unless the dialogue specifically points it out, which they did not do here. The only other parts I noticed were in the first attack scene where the powers start transporting everybody all over. Some Kree soldiers attack Kamala's house and knock her parents over. Her mom is the one shielding her dad. He is scared with his hands up while she looks fierce. In the same scene, Kamala gets transported to the Saber station and shields Nick Fury, who again has his hands up. He also doesn't hit either of the Kree guys. Was this probably on purpose to do a female power thing? Eh, maybe. Is it more than a handful of frames? No. There may be some other little things in the movie somewhere that I missed. Feel free to comment them. But overall, that spirit of activism was not to be found in this movie. Again, it's just a bad movie. No excuses. But people are really crowing about this movie's failure, which Stephen King doesn't like. He tweeted that while he isn't a big fan of the MCU stuff, he also doesn't like the barely masked gloating. Listen. Mr. King's words, they, 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 they got to me. They got me thinking. And, and I just want to, before we go on, I just want to apologize. If it ever came across that I was trying to mask it, however thinly, I want my gloating to be up front and center. So I promise I'll make sure to work on that from now on. I am happy that it failed and I won't pretend not to be. I consider this to be an absolute win for consumers who were abandoned by Marvel to chase a younger, sexier crowd, and it backfired, and that is cause for celebration. Whenever Marvel or Star Wars fails because they tried to take their respective franchises in a completely different, all-female, politically correct direction, and the fans celebrate that failure, you will always see this lame excuse. Oh, just because they called you toxic and took a franchise in a totally pandering direction, you don't have to be happy about its failing. That's just gross. It's the last ditch effort to maintain face when your social politics are revealed to be wildly unpopular and commercially untenable. And everyone wonders why fans care. That's another favorite of mine. I made a video about the Marvels in the spring, and the thumbnail said, why should we care? To sum up that the movie has nothing to draw audiences. Several clever folks commented that I cared enough to make a video. Checkmate! Yep, you got me. Here's the thing. Generally, people complain about things they have an interest in. I love the Disney Company. Or I did until a few years ago. I know my video library would make you think otherwise. Why do I complain about Disney? Because I want better for something that I love. Something that is a big part of my childhood and I hoped to be a part of my children's. You don't get passionate about something that you have no passion for. You're not going to see me getting involved in drama because Kylie Cosmetics uses the same lab as ColourPop because I don't give a damn. What? Sarah J. Moss is putting stuff behind a paywall? I don't read romanticy, so I don't care. There's probably like a serious political fight for like the soul of Mongolia or, or, or something. I, I can't care less. I'm gloating loudly about Disney because I do care and I want to see changes made. The activists who wonder why you care so much are actually self-snitching with that question because they don't care. Whatever shiny new social conquest Twitter tells them to attack next, they'll march without question. Disney and other companies need to take note because when the MCU fails, these social justice customers, social justimers, they wanted so badly won't feel one scrap of remorse for destroying a franchise. They'll be too busy on the next crusade to change the name of something because it's like a microaggression or whatever. But Disney does maybe seem to possibly understand a little bit of the way the winds are shifting. They have delayed every theatrical release in 2024 besides Deadpool 3. They have also rolled out a new name for their MCU Disney Plus shows, calling them Marvel Spotlights, starting with Echo. This is meant to highlight how the show is a totally standalone thing that you don't have to have any background for. It's also presumably not going to be required homework for future viewings. Disney seems to be getting that part of the problem as well. Think about the fact that this whole thing started in 2008. Ms. Marvel and the Young Avengers are being marketed to a younger audience who were still in pull-ups when Iron Man came out. Now, to catch up, they need to watch 33 movies and 20 shows to know everything. One of the big delays is the next Falcon movie, Captain America New World Order. 
Also delayed was the Ironheart show, originally scheduled for the slot that went to Loki season two. I hear that's really good. Like I need to move that up in the queue. Reports are coming in that Captain America was delayed due to poor test screenings, just like the Marvels was, so that's not a good sign. This is complete conjecture based on their recent stuff, but I imagine the poor screenings are coming from the fact that Falcon no longer has character traits, just his skin color, same as Ironheart. Recently, I did a video comparing the scenes, introducing Ruffalo Hulk and introducing Ironheart. I got a handful of comments telling me that I just didn't get some of the cultural references. Like, the young, black, and gifted line is a reference to a song and has been like a civil rights anthem, which I did not know. Fenty is owned by Rihanna and caters to black skin tones. That I did know. I know more about makeup than I want to know. I was told her dialogue and Okoye's was authentically black and African, respectively. And those things are great. If you're going to have a black character, they should sound authentically black, however you want to define that. It sounds weird otherwise. The point is that the cultural dialogue in Wakanda Forever isn't the problem. It would be super weird if Shuri went to Riri's room and she was listening to Natalie and Brulia and then they went out to the pumpkin patch and had boba tea and talked about how great shiplap looks in an open concept house. No, the issue is that their authentic cultural references only tell me that they are indeed black, which I already know because I have the same superpowers as Monica Rambeau. You can absorb light. I can see it. The dialogue tells me nothing about these characters beyond their skin tone. Skin color is not a character trait and neither is genitals. This is the thing that Marvel isn't getting and it's what I'm betting is holding Captain America back. His show really expanded on his character to let us know something brand new. I'm a black man. This was a massive focus of the show, and I have no doubt in the current MCU climate, they only went harder on it in his movie. But black is not a character trait. You can't build a story on skin color. Oh, skin color might inform character traits, but you have to show those. Here's where we're seeing the focus on representation really fall apart. It's purely surface level, and the tokens don't have depth for the audience to actually connect with. Well, I guess we'll find out in a year or so if Disney has learned something and is making changes, or if they're just trying to change the paint and let some time pass so their wanted level goes down. Let me know what you think they'll do. I appreciate you watching, and I'll see you next time.